Chapter Twelve of Villette. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter Twelve: The Casket. Behind the house at the Rue Fossette, there was a garden, large considering that it lay in the heart of a city. And to my recollection, at this day, it seems pleasant. But time, like distance, lends to certain scenes an influence so softening. And where all is stone around, blank wall and hot pavement, how precious seems one shrub, how lovely an enclosed and planted spot of ground! There went a tradition that Madame Beck's house had, in old days, been a convent, that in years gone by, how long gone by I cannot tell, but I think some centuries, before the city had overspread this quarter, and when it was tilled ground and avenue and such deep and leafy seclusion as ought to embosom a religious house, that something had happened on this site which, rousing fear and inflicting horror, had left to the place the inheritance of a ghost story. A vague tale went of a black and white nun, sometimes on some night or nights of the year, seen in some part of this vicinage. The ghost must have been built out some ages ago, for there were houses all round now, but certain convent relics, in the shape of old and huge fruit trees, yet consecrated the spot, and at the foot of one, a Methuselah of a pear tree, dead all but a few boughs which still faithfully renewed their perfumed snow in spring, and their honey-sweet pendants in autumn, you saw, in scraping away the mossy earth beneath the half-bared roots, a glimpse of slab, smooth, hard, and black. The legend went, unconfirmed and unaccredited, but still propagated, that this was the portal of a vault, imprisoning deep beneath that ground, on whose surface grass grew and flowers bloomed, the bones of a girl whom a monkish conclave of the drear Middle Ages had here buried alive for some sin against her vow. Her shadow it was that tremblers had feared, through long generations after her poor frame was dust. Her black robe and white veil, that, for timid eyes, moonlight and shade, had mocked, as they fluctuated in the night wind through the garden thicket. Independently of romantic rubbish, however, that old garden had its charms. On summer mornings I used to rise early, to enjoy them alone, on summer evenings to linger solitary, to keep tryst with the rising moon, or taste one kiss of the evening breeze, or fancy rather than feel the freshness of dew descending. The turf was verdant, the gravelled walks were white. Sun-bright nasturtiums clustered beautiful about the roots of the dotted orchard giants. There was a large berceau, above which spread the shade of an acacia. There was a smaller, more sequestered bower, nestled in the vines which ran all along a high and grey wall, and gathered their tendrils in a knot of beauty, and hung their clusters in loving profusion about the favoured spot where jasmine and ivy met and married them. Doubtless at high noon, in the broad, vulgar middle of the day, when Madame Beck's large school turned out rampant, and extern and pensionnaires were spread abroad, vying with the denizens of the boys' college close at hand, in the brazen exercise of their lungs and limbs, doubtless then the garden was a trite, trodden-down place enough. But at sunset, or the hour of salut, when the extern were gone home, and the boarders quieted their studies. Pleasant was it, then, to stray down the peaceful alleys, and hear the bells of St. Jean-Baptiste peal out their sweet, soft, exalted sound. I was walking thus one evening, and had been detained farther within the verge of twilight than usual, by the still-deepening calm, the mellow coolness, the fragrant breathing with which flowers no sunshine could win now answered the persuasion of the dew. I saw, by light in the oratory window, that the Catholic household were then gathered to evening prayer, a rite from attendance on which I now and then, as a Protestant, exempted myself. "'One moment longer,' whispered solitude in the summer moon. "'Stay with us. All is quiet now.' For another quarter of an hour your presence will not be missed. 
The day's heat and bustle have tired you. Enjoy these precious minutes. The winterless backs of houses built in this garden, and in particular the whole of one side, was skirted by the rear of a long line of premises, being the boarding houses of the neighbouring college. This rear, however, was all blank stone, with the exception of certain attic loopholes high up, opening from the sleeping rooms of the women servants and also one casement in a lower story, said to mark the chamber or study of a master. But, though thus secure, an alley which ran parallel with the very high wall on that side, the garden, was forbidden to be entered by the pupils. It was called, indeed, La Allée de Fondu, and any girl setting foot there would have rendered herself liable to as severe a penalty as the mild rules of Madame Beck's establishment permitted. Teachers might indeed go there with impunity, but as the walk was narrow, and the neglected shrubs were grown very thick and close on each side, weaving overhead a roof of branch and leaf which the sun's rays penetrated but in rare checkers, this alley was seldom entered even during day, and after dusk was carefully shunned. From the first I was tempted to make an exception to this rule of avoidance. The seclusion, the very gloom of the walk, attracted me. For a long time the fear of seeming singular scared me away, but by degrees as people became accustomed to me and my habits, and to such shades of peculiarity as were ingrained in my nature, shades certainly not striking enough to interest, and perhaps not prominent enough to offend, but born in and with me, and no more to be parted with than my identity. By slow degrees I became a frequenter of this straight and narrow path. I made myself gardener of some tintless flowers that grew between its closely ranked shrubs. I cleared away the relics of past autumns, choking up a rustic seat at the far end. Borrowing of Gauton, the cuisinaire, a pail of water and a scrubbing brush, I made this seat clean. Madame saw me at work, and smiled approbation. Whether sincerely or not, I don't know, but she seemed sincere. Voyez-vous, cried she, comme elle est propre, cette demoiselle Lucie. Vous aimez donne cette allée, miss? Yes, I said. It is quiet and shady. C'est juste, cried she with an air of bonté and she kindly recommended me to confine myself to it as much as I chose, saying that as I was not charged with the surveillance, I need not trouble myself to walk with the pupils. Only I might permit her children to come there, to talk English with me. On the night in question, I was sitting on the hidden seat reclaimed from fungi and mould, listening to what seemed the far-off sounds of the city. Far off, in truth, they were not, the school was in the city's centre. Hence it was but five minutes' walk to the park, scarce ten to buildings of palatial splendour. Quite near were wide streets brightly lit, teeming at this moment with life. Carriages were rolling through them to balls or to the opera. The same hour which told curfew for our convent, which extinguished each lamp and dropped the curtain round each couch, rang for the gay city about us the summons to festal enjoyment. Of this contrast I thought not, however. Gay instincts my nature had few. Ball or opera I had never seen, and though often I had heard them described, and even wished to see them, it was not the wish of one who hopes to partake a pleasure if she could only reach it, who feels fitted to shine in some bright distant sphere, could she but thither win her way. It was no yearning to attain, no hunger to taste, only the calm desire to look on a new thing. A moon was in the sky, not a full moon, but a young crescent. I saw her through a space in the boughs overhead. She and the stars, visible beside her, were no strangers where all else was strange. My childhood knew them. I had seen that golden sign with the dark lobe and its curve leaning back on azure, beside an old thorn at the top of an old field, in old England, in long past days, just as it now leaned back beside a stately spire in this continental capital. Oh, my childhood! I had feelings. Passive as I lived, little as I spoke, cold as I looked, 
when I thought of past days, I could feel. About the present, it was better to be stoical. About the future, such a future as mine, to be dead. And in catalepsy and a dead trance, I studiously held the quick of my nature. At that time, I well remember whatever could excite. Certain accidents of the weather, for instance, were almost dreaded by me because they woke the being I was always lulling and stirred up a craving cry I could not satisfy. One night a thunderstorm broke, a sort of hurricane, shook us in our beds. The Catholics rose in panic and prayed to their saints. As for me, the tempest took hold of me with tyranny. I was roughly roused and obliged to live. I got up and dressed myself, and, creeping outside the casement close by my bed, sat on its ledge, with my feet on the roof of a lower adjoining building. It was wet. It was wild. It was pitch dark. Within the dormitory they gathered round the night lamp in consternation, praying loud. I could not go in. Too resistless was the delight of staying with the wild hour, black and full of thunder, peeling out such an ode as language never delivered to man. Too terribly glorious, the spectacle of clouds split and pierced by white and blinding bolts. I did long, achingly, then and for four and twenty hours afterwards, for something to fetch me out of my present existence, and lead me upwards and onwards. This longing, and all of a similar kind, it was necessary to knock on the head, which I did, figuratively, after the manner of Yael to Sisera, driving a nail through their temples. Unlike Sisera, they did not die. They were but transiently stunned and at intervals would turn on the nail with a rebellious wrench. Then did the temples bleed, and the brain thrill to its core. Tonight I was not so mutinous, nor so miserable. My Cicera lay quiet in the tent, slumbering, and if his pain ached through his slumbers, something like an angel, the ideal, knelt near, dropping balm on the soothed temples, holding before the sealed eyes a magic glass, of which the sweet solemn visions were repeated in dreams, and shedding reflex from her moonlight wings in robe over the transfixed sleeper, over the tent threshold, over all the landscape lying without. Yael, the stern woman, sat apart, relenting somewhat over her captive, but more prone to dwell on the faithful expectation of Heber coming home. By which words I mean that the cool peace and dewy sweetness of the night filled me with a mood of hope. Not hope on any definite point, but a general sense of encouragement and heart-ease. Should not such a mood, so sweet, so tranquil, so unwanted, have been the harbinger of good? Alas, no good came of it. Presently the rude reel burst coarsely in, all evil grovelling and repellent as she too often is. Amid the intense stillness of that pile of stone overlooking the walk, the trees, the high wall, I heard a sound. A casement, all the windows here are casements, opening on hinges, creaked. Ere I had time to look up and mark where, in which story, or by whom unclosed, a tree overhead shook, as if struck by a missile, some object dropped prone at my feet. Nine was striking by Saint-Jean-Baptiste's clock. Day was fading, but it was not dark. The crescent moon aided little, but the deep gilding of that point in heaven where the sun beamed last, and the crystalline clearness of a wide space above, sustained the summer twilight. Even in my dark walk I could, by approaching an opening, have managed to read print of a small type. Easy was it to see, then, that the missile was a box, a small box of white and coloured ivory. Its loose lid opened in my hand. Violets lay within, violets smothering a closely folded bit of pink paper, a note, superscribed, pour la robe grise. I wore indeed a dress of French grey. Good! Was this a billet doux? 
a thing I had heard of, but hitherto had not had the honour of seeing or handling. Was it this sort of commodity I held between my fingers and thumb at this moment? Scarcely. I did not dream it for a moment. Suitor or admirer my very thoughts had not conceived. All the teachers had dreams of some lover. One, but she was naturally of a credulous turn, believed in a future husband. All the pupils above fourteen knew of some prospective bridegroom. Two or three were already affianced by their parents, and had been so from childhood. But into the realm of feelings and hopes which such prospects open, my speculations, far less my presumptions, had never once had warrant to intrude. If the other teachers went into town, or took a walk on the boulevards, or only attended mass, they were very certain, according to the accounts brought back, to meet with some individual of the opposite sex, whose rapt, earnest gaze assured them of the power to strike and to attract. I can't say that my experience tallied with theirs in this respect. I went to church, and I took walks, and am very well convinced that nobody minded me. There was not a girl or woman in the Rue Fossette who could not, and did not, testify to having received an admiring beam from our young doctor's blue eyes at one time or other. I am obliged, however humbling it may sound, to accept myself. As far as I was concerned, those blue eyes were guiltless, and calm as the sky to whose tint theirs seemed akin. So it came to pass that I heard the others talk wondered often at the gaiety, security, and self-satisfaction, but did not trouble myself to look up and gaze along the path they seemed so certain of treading. This, then, was no bill ado, and it was in settled conviction to the contrary that I quietly opened it. Thus it ran, I translate, Angel of my dreams, a thousand thousand thanks for the promise kept. Scarcely did I venture to hope its fulfilment. I believed you, indeed, to be half in jest, and then you seemed to think the enterprise beset with such danger, the hour so untimely, the alley so strictly secluded. Often, you said, haunted by that dragon, the English teacher, un véritable begul britannique, et ce que vous dites espèce de monstre, brusque et rude, comme un vieux caporel de grenadier, the reader will excuse my modesty in allowing this flattering sketch of my amiable self to retain the slight veil of the original tongue. You are aware, went on this precious effusion, that little Gustav, on account of his illness, has been removed to a master's chamber, that favoured chamber whose lattice overlooks your prison ground. There I, the best uncle in the world, am admitted to visit him. How tremblingly I approached the window, and glanced into your Eden, an Eden for me, though a desert for you. How I feared to behold vacancy, or the dragon aforesaid. How my heart palpitated with delight, when, through apertures in the envious boughs, I at once caught the gleam of your graceful straw hat, and the waving of your grey dress, dress that I should recognise amongst a thousand. But why, my angel, will you not look up? cruel to deny me one ray of those adorable eyes. How a single glance would have revived me! I write this in fiery haste. While the physician examines Gustav, I snatch an opportunity to enclose it in a small casket, together with a bouquet of flowers, the sweetest that blow, yet less sweet than thee, my Perry, my all charming, ever thine, thou well knowest whom. I wish I did know whom! was my comment, and the wish bore even closer reference to the person addressed in this choice document than to the writer thereof. Perhaps it was from the fiancé of one of the engaged pupils, and in that case there was no great harm done, or intended, only small irregularity. Several of the girls, the majority indeed, had brothers or cousins at the neighbouring college. But la robe grise, le chapeau de paille. Here surely was a clue, a very confusing one. The straw hat was an ordinary garden head-screen, common to a score besides myself. The grey dress hardly gave more definite indication. 
Madame Beck herself ordinarily wore a grey dress just now. Another teacher and three of the pensionnaires had had grey dresses purchased of the same shade and fabric as mine. It was a sort of everyday wear which happened at that time to be in vogue. Meanwhile, as I pondered, I knew I must go in. Lights moving in the dormitory announced that prayers were over, and the pupils going to bed. Another half hour, and all doors would be locked, all lights extinguished. The front door yet stood open, to admit into the heated house the coolness of the summer night. From the portress's cabinet, close by, shone a lamp, showing the long vestibule, with the two-leaved drawing-room doors on one side, the great street door closing the vista. All at once, quick rang the bell. Quick, but not loud. A cautious tinkle, a sort of warning metal whisper. Rosine darted from her cabinet and ran to open. The person, she admitted, stood with her two minutes in parley. There seemed a demure, a delay. Rosine came to the garden door, lamp in hand. She stood on the steps, lifting her lamp, looking round vaguely. Quel conte! she cried with a coquettish laugh. Personne n'y a été. Let me pass, pleaded a voice I knew. I ask but five minutes. And a familiar shape, tall and grand, as we of the Rue Fossette all thought it, issued from the house, and strode down amongst the beds and walks. It was sacrilege, the intrusion of a man into that spot at that hour. But he knew himself privileged, and perhaps he trusted to the friendly night. He wandered down the alleys, looking on this side and on that. He was lost in the shrubs, trampling flowers and breaking branches in his search. He penetrated at last the forbidden walk. There I met him, like some ghost, I suppose. Dr. John, it is found. He did not ask by whom, for with his quick eye he perceived that I held it in my hand. Do not betray her, he said, looking at me as if I were indeed a dragon. Were I ever so disposed to treachery, I cannot betray what I do not know, was my answer. Read the note, and you will see how little it reveals. Perhaps you have read it, I thought to myself, and yet I could not believe he wrote it. That could hardly be his style. Besides, I was fool enough to think there would be a degree of hardship in his calling me such names. His own look vindicated him. He grew hot and coloured as he read. This is indeed too much. This is cruel. This is humiliating, were the words that fell from him. I thought it was cruel when I saw his countenance so moved. No matter whether he was to blame or not, somebody, it seemed to me, must be more to blame. What shall you do about it? He inquired of me. Shall you tell Madame Beck what you have found and cause a stir and a scalandre? I thought I ought to tell, and said so, adding that I did not believe there would be either stir or esclandre. Madame was much too prudent to make a noise about an affair of that sort connected with her establishment. He stood looking down and meditating. He was both too proud and too honourable to entreat my secrecy on a point which duty evidently commanded me to communicate. I wished to do right, yet loathed to grieve or injure him. Just then, Rosine glanced out through the open door. She could not see us, though between the trees I could plainly see her. Her dress was grey, like mine. This circumstance, taken in connection with prior transactions, suggested to me that perhaps the case, however deplorable, was one in which I was under no obligation whatever to concern myself. Accordingly, I said— if you can assure me that none of Madame Beck's pupils are implicated in this business, I shall be very happy to stand aloof from all interference. Take the casket, the bouquet, and the billet. For my part, I gladly forget the whole affair. Look there, he whispered suddenly, as his hand closed on what I offered, and at the same time he pointed through the boughs. I looked. Behold Madame, in shawl, wrapping gown, and slippers, softly descending the steps and stealing like a cat round the garden. In two minutes she would have been upon Dr. John. If she were like a cat, however, he quite as much resembled a leopard. 
Nothing could be lighter than his tread when he chose. He watched, and as she turned a corner, he took the garden at two noiseless bounds. She reappeared, and he was gone. Rosine helped him, instantly interposing the door between him and his huntress. I too might have got away, but I preferred to meet Madame openly. Though it was my frequent and well-known custom to spend twilight in the garden, yet never till now had I remained so late. Full sure was I that Madame had missed, was come in search of me, and designed now to pounce on the defaulter unawares. I expected a reprimand. No, Madame was all goodness. She tendered not even a remonstrance. She testified no shade of surprise. With that consummate tact of hers, in which I believe she was never surpassed by living thing, she even professed merely to have issued forth to taste la brise du soir. Quelle belle nuit! cried she, looking up at the stars. The moon was now gone down behind the broad tower of Jean Baptiste. Qu'il fait bon! Clair et frais! And instead of sending me in, she detained me to take a few turns with her down the principal alley. When, at last, we both re-entered, she leaned affably on my shoulder by way of support in mounting the front door steps. At parting, her cheek was presented to my lips, and— Bonsoir, my bon ami. Dormez bien. Was her kindly adieu for the night. I caught myself smiling as I lay awake and thoughtful on my couch. Smiling at Madame. The unction, the suavity of her behaviour offered, for one who knew her, a sure token that suspicion of some kind was busy in her brain. From some aperture or summit of observation, through parted bough or open window, she had doubtless caught a glimpse, remote or near, deceptive or instructive, of that night's transactions. Finally accomplished as she was in the art of surveillance, it was next to impossible that a casket could be thrown into her garden, or an interloper should cross her walks to seek it, without that she, in shaken branch, passing shade, unwanted footfall, or stilly murmur, and though Dr. John had spoken very low in the few words he dropped me, yet the hum of his man's voice pervaded, I thought, the whole conventual ground. Without, I say, that she should have caught intimation of things extraordinary transpiring on her premises, what things she might by no means see or at that time be able to discover, but a delicious little ravelled plot lay tempting her to disentanglement, and in the midst folded round and round in cobwebs, had she not secured Miss Lucy, clumsily involved like the foolish fly she was. End of chapter 12